Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Noetic Podcast. I'm your host, Jordan Klein, and I'm joined by... CJ! And tonight, we're going to continue our seminar series on Michel, uh, Michel de Montaigne's essays. There we go. Yes. And what are we going to be looking at today, Jordan? And uh, tonight, uh, we're going to... This is going to be probably a long burn tonight on uh, Chapter 14, and titled the... Uh, that the taste of good and evil depends, for a good part, upon the idea we form of them. And with that, I'll just hand the reins on over to you, CJ. Sure. So let's take a little time to digest this title, because I think it mm-hmm. gives us a lot to talk about, and will be what we're going to talk about and what Montaigne dives into in this particular essay. So we have that the taste of good and evil depends upon the idea we form of them. And this is something that you and I, Jordan, have discussed in our Marcus Aurelius podcast right. mm-hmm. of stoicism, yep. of this idea that something is not good or bad, but thinking makes it so, to paraphrase Shakespeare, mm-hmm. that a lot of our afflictions in life are caused by how we react to right. them. And I think that if we might use the sort of stoic vocabulary for that, Marcus Aurelius would call them impressions. Mm. So the events that happen to us that we sort of take in as data points, we form impressions on these events and these uh, sort of like the, the, this phenomena. And Montaigne, yeah, and Montaigne takes that up. But the fascinating part about this title, what I think I just realized now was... Mm-hmm. The that the taste of good and evil depends for a good part upon the idea we form of them. Mm -hmm. That it isn't as simple as it's all just your imagination. Right, or it's all in your head. We're going to get a little push back from Montaigne in this essay. Yeah, and I think that he is very well versed in the classics, right? Uh, as we've seen so far in our sort of adventures with uh, Montaigne. But he does also offer some pushback, so I'm excited to sort of see where he goes with that. Yeah, so let's start this essay, this little journey into a nugget of stoic thought. So he starts off by showing his cards. We're going to explore this idea that... Again, the taste of good and evil depends for a good part upon the idea we form of them. That we are tormented by the ideas which form of things, but not by the things themselves that happen to us. And Montaigne says, well, wouldn't it be great if we all could do this? And I'll quote him by saying, you know, wouldn't it be great point gain for the solace of our miserable human condition if this proposition could be established as true everywhere and in all things Mm -hmm. that if we could just know that it's all in our heads and respond accordingly then that'd be that'd be the cat's bag pajamas pajamas. (laughs) and we'd all be fine and we could live in a wonderful world but it's not the case because we all envision things differently or as Montaigne Mm -hmm. would put it some people have the could have the true essence of something but there are a thousand others harboring within other people that are new and contrary to that one essence and that one essence is going to be the thing that he explores in this essay or as as you put it in our previous little talk before we went on as the hypothesis that he teases out through this essay, is that can there be something with one essence? Can something be truly good? Can something be truly evil at the heart of it? Right, so I think that the sort of, uh, the, the gist, right, the main sort of question or the main sort of line of inquiry that Montaigne wants to go with is whether or not what we truly deem evil is truly evil or truly good is good. And I think that he more so focuses on sort of the evil in order to sort of understand the good. Yes, because what we're going to see, and it's great you pointed that out, is that 
sometimes what is considered evil is also considered good or can be can be a good in and of itself in and of itself mm-hmm. and maybe in spite of it mm-hmm. right where yeah. it, it kind of combines the good and the evil yeah in so some way. i think with that i think it'd be helpful if we started to sketch out what are what are these what are these evils that montaigne sure takes up in so, this essay right after our little bit here montaigne lines up three as he calls them, principal enemies. These things that he would take it to be universal evils. Right. But we all would consider universal evils. And those are death, pain, and poverty. And he deals with these three in that order. So we start with death. Death. Of all things dreadful, the most dreadful, as some call it, this would have to be a universal evil. But Montaigne sees it and sees examples of that not being the case, Mm -hmm. right? Where some people actually, as Montaigne says, support her more easily than life Mm -hmm. itself. And that some go as cheerfully as Socrates. Yeah, and some people may look forward to death because life is too hard. They might be, hey, death is like the the known constant that I can take comfort in, whereas life has all of these sort of varying, scary, upsetting complications, but death is simple. Yeah, and it can take away any kind of inconvenience that might get in your way or if you don't want to face something yeah or pain you could do it and montaigne Mm -hmm. lists that as one of the reasons people go cheerfully to death as he says it is from fear of some slight inconvenience that people go to their deaths or that some merely to flee the satiety of living Mm -hmm. That there is something, as you said, that drives people to see death as a comfort rather than Mm -hmm. deal with the tragedy or the the pain, as we'll go into a little further, of living. And then Montaigne lists other reasons as we go cheerfully to death as Socrates. One, he sees people that are led to... Their deaths led to hang, led to the guillotine or whatever. And somebody says, wait, you're going to have a choice to live if you marry this woman. And maybe they just pull a random woman out of the crowd. Mm -hmm. And many times these gentlemen say, "Uh, no, she limps. I don't want to deal with that marriage. Just kill me now. Take me. Mm -hmm. And then others go to their deaths joking. And Mm -hmm. just being jolly. Like the one guy, uh, was the one guy who was led uh, by the executioner? And he was like, don't go down this street because I owe that guy money on that (laughs) street. I I owe him some money. I don't want to go down there. I don't want to run into him. (laughs) So yeah, so there are people who are kind of just like humorously defiant up until the end. And if I could reference one more, I think there was a instance where the man and the hangman were drinking, or at least the hangman was having alcohol, and then he gave it to he gave the cup to the man that was about to be hanged. And the man declined, he said, Oh no, 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 no. You might give me smallpox <laughs> As if that wouldn't matter at all. When you're going to be hung in moments notice. As if you could get some allpox Mm -hmm. in that time or if he's going to live on further. So that's those are two examples. Joking and even just like not choosing to marry. But then if we get a little more serious, Montaigne Mm -hmm. includes the example of certain cultures. And in particular, the kingdom of Narsinga. Where the wives, if their husbands, and we're assuming kings or at least of some nobility, priests, mm-hmm. priests, 
especially died as those dead men were put on the pyre and are burning their wives were also expected to jump on and Jordan you tell me too also just the whole family or at least the whole yeah I mean house the, the whole household including servants and and the like so that's not even wives that's mm-hmm. just everyone of the house going willingly mm-hmm. into death and Montaigne right. emphasizes that that they jump on the pyre to join their their husbands or the man of the house so that leads us to this idea that Montaigne has of people also dying or being willing to die for an opinion mm-hmm. as I'll, and I'll quote him when he say any opinion is strong enough to be espoused at the price of life and by opinion we could also mean belief right. mm-hmm. we could mean religion we could mean country we could mm-hmm. mean law or some noble ideal that people can be willing to die for that and jordan i mean that seems rather obvious i think but it is something to note where wow people can really be willing to die or that there's a cheerful exuberance or enthusiasm to run right to your end oh yeah i mean absolutely and i think that there's something to be said that uh showing contempt for life Mm -hmm. can uh, plant you more firmly in your beliefs Mm. like we saw with Montaigne's account of the persecution of uh, the Jewish population in Portugal Mm -hmm. where I think he said something to the effect of that instead of these people sort of you know shaking in their boots um, that a lot of them opted to kill their own children because they held to their ancestral customs with like that much more tenacity. Mm. So what Montaigne seems to be pointing out here is this spectrum of death mm-hmm. as a positive or as a good, mm-hmm. right? Where we have on one end dying for a slight inconvenience and on the other for noble ideals for religion Mm -hmm. as those persecuted jewish people Mm -hmm. yeah so this is this is the net that montaigne casts for death and it leads to one fascinating i think crucial point that montaigne makes in this essay where he sees our ability to reason to imagine as being this crutch right yeah. and he uses mm-hmm. the story of what was it of Pyrrho's pig uh, okay. yeah so we have the philosopher i believe was it greek or roman philosopher Pyrrho, i'm assuming greek greeks we we'll assume greek most greeks <laughs> okay greek philosopher Pyrrho. he is on a ship in a storm and Everyone else is terrified, scared. And Pyrrho, seeing all of this, and seeing this pig, points out to the pig and points out to the people, for the people's benefit, that look, there is this pig standing there like a stone wall firm in its conviction it's not feeling scared or anything we should be more like that pig Mm -hmm. and this leads Montaigne down this rabbit hole of well hold on what's the use of our reason if it and I'll quote him reduces us to a worse condition than that of Pyrrho's pig yeah, and I think that, to me, this is a really essential 
point in this essay because he asks the question, why do we have reason if we don't apply it for our own benefit, right? Mm -hmm. What's the utility of reason if it doesn't do anything good for us, Mm -hmm. essentially? Right. And we see this so many times, at least. I think this is maybe where Montaigne uses these examples to show that okay maybe we do use reason in a positive sense or at least that we can use it Mm -hmm. for our benefit or we can look at these things that are quote-unquote negative and direct it in a positive way right Mm -hmm. and this is how he concludes his thoughts or this one idea serves as a transition to our second primary enemy, our second evil, which is pain. And Montaigne starts out this aspect, this evil, with a story of Poseidonus and Pompey. And Poseidonus Poseidonus being this philosopher and Pompey this Roman political figure and Pompey goes to visit Poseidonus to get a lesson of philosophy and Poseidonus is going on and then he sort of stumbles because he's in pain he has some sort of sickness or some sort of malady that is tearing at him and Pompey Stands back and says, whoa, 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 whoa. I can come back at a better time when you're feeling better. Right, when you're feeling up to talk philosophy. But Pompey says, no, this is where I need to talk philosophy. I'm not going to stop. And he goes on. And I'll quote Pompey, or better yet, I will quote Poseidonus, when he says, you may do your worst pain, you will... Yet will I not say that you are an evil? And this is where Montaigne starts. And Montaigne says, well, wait a second. Hold on. Mm -hmm. How does this prove contempt of pain? Is he really getting at pain or is he more so getting at the word pain? Right. Mm -hmm. And it leads Montaigne to suspect that if it if pain was really just a figment of his imagination and was not affecting him in some way why did he why did Poseidonus stumble in the beginning why did Pompey have to say I'll come back later if it was really just something in his mind and was something he could be completely unaware of yeah and i think to montaigne's point if a man studies philosophy then he's sort of conditioned by reason right Mm -hmm. so if a man who is very in control of his reason and the possession of his mind and his emotions why is he stopping mid-sentence keeling over in pain yeah because if he was if he was in control of his reason and emotions then he wouldn't have been like, oh, wait a minute, I gotta, hold up, wait, you know? He wouldn't I'm not gonna have, he stop. Have <laughs> yeah, exactly, he wouldn't have just, like, physically paused. But at this point, Montaigne points out that there's a discrepancy between the mind and the body. Yeah, great, great point, because he says, and Montaigne's just gonna take off of what you said, and then I'll quote him when he says, here, it is not all imagination, with this example it is not all reason alone that Mm -hmm. is acting on Poseidonus it is that we still and this is another crucial point is that we still feel our senses are still at work as Montaigne says Pyrrho's pig is here in the same boat with us it is true that he is not afraid of death 
But if you beat him, he will rush about and squeal. He is still on the boat with us. There is still a mm-hmm. sensory element for Piro's pig. Right, exactly. And I think that it kind of speaks to uh, what Luke and I discussed in our uh, Augustine seminars about the sort of... Uh, there's reason, but we also have sensory input. Mm-hmm. And that sort of reason governs the sensory faculties, but you still can't ignore those physical sensations. Yeah, so let's let's get into those sensory feelings or at least pain a little further sure Mm -hmm. because we're gonna develop or at least montaigne's gonna develop we're just merely talking about montaigne's ideas but montaigne is going to connect the thread of death and pain right because there is a relationship yeah between the two right because we have the sensory so we feel pain Mm -hmm. right. right we can't really control that but Again, to go back to our idea of the taste of good and evil depends upon the idea we form of them. We form this connection of pain to death. But what is the thing about death, though? Mm. Yeah, it's, he essentially says that death is really in the mind and death is really in yeah. thought. Because as, so death, yeah. death by itself is not a painful event. Yeah, as, as his friend mm-hmm. Labotier says, "'Tis coming or tis past, but present it is never." Mm-hmm. Death is only in our minds. When we experience death, that's it. We can't say, "Oh yeah, I died yesterday. It was oh, it's great experience." You know, I, 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 let me tell you all about it. Even though we do have those right. accounts, at least, of, I went to heaven, let me tell you what it was like, you know, right, near-death yeah. experiences. But I think there's an emphasis there, is near-death. It's not mm-hmm. actually death itself. If I figure it out, then I'll, I'll, I'll let you guys know. Please, please, <laughs> we can have a whole other podcast about that. Yeah. That'd be wonderful. But to go along with this idea of death, not of only being in our minds... Since we can't, you know, bear the idea of death, you know, pain, I think, is is even more excruciating to bear mm-hmm. because it has that extra weight of this pain leading to my demise, mm-hmm. which is this thing that my mind twists and turns in that theater of the imagination as right. this monster as yeah exactly this abyss and it terrifies us right so it's we can't we can't even handle the idea of death to begin with like that's already difficult and then we get so worked about about death that we can't even begin to entertain any associated pain that might come with it mhm but what's really interesting is that um do you remember what Montaigne says about the pain associated with death? I think in the sense in relation to how things that aren't going to kill us like a toothache or gout that those things that only give us a mere affliction that we can take those. Is there another right. thing? Yeah, us? I was thinking uh, the relationship between uh, the pain and death and cowardice. And what I found mm. particularly interesting was Montaigne's assertion that we fear the pain of death because it's less cowardly. As if it's mm. more socially acceptable to sort of fear the pain associated with death than death because it's irrational it's completely absurd to fear death because of its inevitability Mm. so Hmm. sort of the the way for us to the sort of acceptable way for us to fear death is to fear the pain because most people would sympathize with you saying oh yeah i'm really scared about how painful it's going to be to die too right because if you're like i'm so scared to die if you just like walked around saying that all the time people would be like it's part of life Everyone's gonna die. 
Get over it. Right. But if you're like, I'm really scared that my death might be painful, people are going to be like, oh my god, me too. Well, isn't that when we talk about how we would want to die and it's always, well, in our sleep? Or when we talk about someone we know dying in their sleep, we say, Mm -hmm. oh, well, they just went peacefully. We call it peacefully, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, they died peacefully. We don't want, Mm -hmm. oh, they were dying of an excruciating pain and they were just hollering and hollering until their last breath. That scares us because, like you said, that pain that we were going to experience Mm -hmm. beforehand and this all this discussion leads back to the author it leads back to Montaigne himself and his own view of pain which is revealing of his honesty or I don't even know whether to call it modesty and I'll and I'll Mm -hmm. quote him this is his opinion of pain and it will relate to the concluding remarks on pain of what causes it and how one can deal with it so i grant you and willingly that this is the worst thing that can happen to us for if there is a man in the world who hates it and runs away from it it is myself the more so as I have hitherto had little to do with it. Mm-hmm. Montaigne admits he's a wuss. That there we he, have it. He's a wimp. He's a wimp. That honesty leads him to to say, "Look, I I don't really like pain. I I choose to escape it." And yet there's this other element where you're not you escape pain. But it's almost by going to it, you are confronting and defying pain. And that that gives the virtue of courage Mm -hmm. its weight, its gravitas. Mm -hmm. And that this is where we get that odd balance of good and evil, right? Where pain for the virtue of courage to be a good pain has to be an evil in some respect yeah right? i mean there has to be some some level of sort of transcending it right so mm-hmm. in order i think that in order for us to define what is good we need bad things mm-hmm. well discuss the idea of rites of passage i think you were talking about that before and i think that is Um, extremely relevant to this discussion yeah so i mean it seems to me that montaigne is saying that we need pain in order to show and understand virtue Mm -hmm. and that made me think about the word virtue itself so it comes from the latin we're to and then if you take the root of the word of we're to you have we're and that mm. means man. Okay. So in the sort of Roman traditional mindset, in a lot of other sort of ancient cultures, you had this rite of passage. You had to have, and in order to have a rite of passage, it was usually a trial of ordeal or affliction. So this idea that you needed to ex- like literally experience growing pains in order to be considered a man in Roman culture. Mm. So I think that even though Montaigne is very far removed from it, there's still that sentiment of you need pain and affliction and you need adversity and difficulty in order to understand what honor and what virtue really means Mm. and the full weight and the full merit of it, if that makes sense. That makes perfect sense. That's really well put. And I think I want to underline it Mm -hmm. and then put an arrow to a quote from Lucian that Montaigne uses in this essay. And it reads, An honest deed is sweetened by its cost. Mm -hmm. And this honest deed in this case is manhood, of achieving worth in a community, in a society. Mm -hmm. And that honest deed is sweetened by its cost, the cost of pain, of 
excruciating languor and hardship mm -hmm. that it is through that cost that one's place in a society is sweetened or is given worth yeah right? like value right value yes exactly. yeah and what's interesting i think too with this essay with montaigne is that women are actually sort of included in this sort of ordeal right because he says that oh well men men show this through through where like warfare and these sort of you know sort of like martial sort of you know exercises etc and he says that you know women do it too through childbirth mm -hmm. and yeah. i think that uh one example that that struck me and it's really only just sort of a passing footnote at least in my translation but plutarch mentions the wife of this uh, Gallic warrior named Sabinus and the uh, wife named um, Eponina or um, Empona, it sort of varies from translation to translation, she hid her husband uh, because he led this revolt. It was unsuccessful. They literally went underground, <laughs> according to Plutarch. And uh, obviously, since she was still married to him, you know, they were still keeping the conjugal relation, so she was pregnant. And she managed to hide this pregnancy, and I just and I just wanted to um, to read a few uh, sort of snippets of this passage. So she would go, she would resur literally resurface, hang out with friends and family and stuff like that to keep the sort of facade of normalcy, while she was sort of keeping her husband secreted away. Mm -hmm. And uh, when she was pregnant, she would go to the bath with her friends, and she would rub ointment to make herself sort of like swell and puff up all over. So people wouldn't notice her, you know, swelling belly. Mm. And um, so it says, so once it was, she finally was in labor, she, quote, she endured her birth pangs completely alone, like a lioness in a den, descending into the earth to rejoin her husband. She brought up secretly the male cubs that were born. So there's that, so Plutarch even sort of like using that, that language of that, that imagery, right? That you have that sort of that, that ferocity of a woman giving birth with absolutely sort of no help like, like a lioness. So mm. it's sort of fascinating that Montaigne uses this description because it shows that women can in their own way be courageous too. Yeah. But then there's this other element of childbirth where at least... In our Western culture, we view it as this painful ordeal, which it is, but with these examples, they do it with such poise and mm -hmm. going about their day that it isn't the, okay, we have to have much medication and pain relievers as possible in order to go through this. Mm -hmm. And this makes Montaigne wonder, okay, so why, besides childbirth, why do we suffer from pain so much? Why do we have an impatience to it? Mm -hmm. And Montaigne's conclusion arises from the fact that, and I'll quote him, we are not accustomed to find our chief contentment in the soul. And that we do not sufficiently rely on her, the her being our soul. So we have two things going on here. We got the body, mm -hmm. which has one bent, right? Just as Montaigne said, yep. Piro's pig, it's going to get hurt. It'll squeal. Mm -hmm. We're going to get hurt and our body's going to react. But then we have the soul, or as Jordan put it, the imagination. We have reason, which takes on various guises, various forms. And that's where the problem lies, right? Mm -hmm. That that we can, again, it goes back to Piro's pig example, right? That we can reason and that we can right. imagine mm -hmm. is that where we have our problems. So Montaigne's solution then is, okay, so if we have this bent then perhaps we need to study our own souls we have to know thyself we have to 
understand how we react to things in order to put it under control using our reason to maybe have that initial reaction of oh my god oh my god but then say wait hold on it's not like that turbulence doesn't mean that we're going to die it just means there's turbulence relax and in knowing how you react and adjusting it accordingly you can have a better viewpoint of life and I think we were talking earlier about how maybe these essays in of themselves are like a way for Montaigne to study his own self right mm -hmm. yeah and that is one of the benefits at least of writing this out in paper at least for him and maybe it's something we can do whether i mean we journal or we just think about it you know just to understand how we react to things right and i think too that for him writing is a way of him sort of using reason mm. in the right? good and positive the, the sense. yeah the intellectual pursuit of using reason and writing and sort of conditioning sort of his mind and his soul mm. like this is sort of, in a way it could be a training for him so that almost goes to that point that you know the taste of good and evil depends on your own reaction to it mm -hmm. and that you can fine-tune that reaction which we learn from marcus aurelius that we can take that and work with it to our benefit and from there i'm going to pass the baton to jordan and she's going to discass pain a little bit further yeah okay so we'll, and then we'll, we'll it... yeah and then we'll get to poverty to finish it all off but... right so we talked about a lot of the the negative aspects of pain right so he actually goes into cuz he sort of does the the good things of death the bad things of death and mm -hmm. we did the bad things of pain so now we're sort of merging into the 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 good the, things the because good we things did talk about pain. courage and mm -hmm. or maybe my courage in the face of death i suppose but or like the maybe like the the nobility of death yeah we could see if there's anything uh admirable with with pain yeah so what's what's some admirable things that montaigne finds yeah so i mean obviously like montaigne really being in the classics and stuff like that and always always referring to sparta whenever he can <laughs> he mentions uh the the sort of spartan practices of training boys and Ooh, yeah. so the the whole sort of institution is called the agoge and in this process boys at the age of 7 are taken away from their homes they're basically thrown into this sort of like mess hall in this cohort and they are trained in warfare and they're minimally provisioned they have to steal for their own survival so they have to learn how to live by their own wits they're conditioned to operate survive and function with pretty much no food mm -hmm. and um another uh sort of uh festival that stood out in my mind and i'm pretty sure plutarch writes about this it's called the artemis orthea and it's this festival and uh the kids the kids are starving right so they're brought into this uh sort of uh sort of temple sacred space and they have to steal cheese that's on an altar and bizarrely so the there's like a mad dash for these kids to steal this cheese and the kids who aren't fast enough get flogged to death which you think and especially in our our modern mindset we think this is absolutely crazy like this is completely inhumane but this is just how the spartans operated so is that showing pain as a rite of passage like we did with the mm -hmm. yeah okay. so i think it's pain as a rite of passage but i also think that it so it ties into this sort of martial idea of uh disciplina of using training and teaching to sort of habituate yourself to learn mm -hmm. how to withstand these hardships 
Now, these are very, obviously very extreme cases, right, of, of pain and hardship, but it taught these um, kids how to survive under very extreme conditions mm-hmm. in sort of their, their military careers. So I think that's one sort of aspect that we should think of is that pain pain is an excellent teacher, right? Yeah, no, and it can also be an excellent way to ruse your enemy, or at least to convince people, right? At least with the example of Skyvola. Yeah, so um, it's one of like one of my favorite like figures ever from like the early Republic. So this guy, uh, Mucius Skyvola, wanted to end this blockade that their neighbors placed on them. So he went to the the senators and said, "All right, I want to end this once and for all. I want to kill this Etruscan king." So the senators are like, okay, fine, go ahead. So this guy sneaks into the Etruscan camp. It's payday. Secretary and the king are standing right next to each other, doling out pay. They look the same. Scavola essentially kills the secretary. And uh, so he gets captured, obviously. And the king threatens to roast him if he doesn't spill the plot. He's like, I don't know what you're all about, but I'm going to find out. And I'm going to roast you alive if you don't tell me. And on this altar, Mucius Scavola sticks his arm in the fire and says, according to, uh, to Livy, Look, Mucius cried, and learn how lightly those regard their bodies who have some great glory in view. And he plunges his hand into the altar and, quote, mm-hmm. whilst keeping it roasting there as if he were devoid of all sensation, the king astounded at this preternatural conduct sprang from his seat and ordered the youth to be removed from the altar. Go, he said. You have been a worse enemy to yourself than me. I would invoke blessings on your courage if it were displayed on behalf of my country. As it is, I send away exempt from all rights of war, unhurt, and safe. Yeah, let's emphasize that that first little saying from Sky Volo where he says and mm-hmm. and learn how lightly those regard their bodies who have some great glory in, in view, view that that mm-hmm. sense where pain can be a benefit when one has great glory yeah and in pain, view and pain but, can pain can be ennobling right mm-hmm. that's that's the interesting part and can lead pain. one to feel mercy or to grant clemency to an Mm -hmm. individual if they show that sort of valor but i'm wondering if that great glory could have been death as well right and then maybe that ties into the idea of of dying for one's country or more for one's emperor or one's belief right and i mean this this king says you know i would i would i would have bestowed blessing on you if if you were representing you know, Etruria. Yeah, and I think I think it's important to note here how all of these are tied together, death. Right. And so pain pain, pain can poverty, be, yeah. Yeah, and pain can be aggrandizing and uh, in a similar vein, he he said, you know, Montaigne again pivots and he's like, Now it's the ladies turn Yeah, because we've been talking I mean, granted we use the example of the wife of Sabinus, right. Right, but mm-hmm. we haven't really talked about women much and right. Montaigne says hey mm-hmm. I'm equal opportunity baby yep and he talks about how uh, pain can be beautiful right pain can be this sort of beautifying thing of women flaying their skin so it resurfaces and it looks more smooth and and more uh, colorful and how uh, you know pull, you, people like pull their teeth out uh, to make their teeth look nicer or to, to sound better mm. and there's that really fascinating, and you know, uh, he mentions women, uh, you know, corset training and you know, probably cracking their the rib yeah. cages by like trying to obtain like a nice, you know, hourglass, you know, figure and just these sort of torments, right, that people subject themselves to, in order to look good. And what's so fascinating is that for a lot of people, fear is very minimal when beauty lies on the other side of it. Hey, that great glory, right? It's so, that great glory. It's, it's like, so wonderful yeah. you mentioned that Skyvola mm-hmm. quote because I think it 
really works well with what you're talking about, what Montaigne's discussing, that that look how lightly I regard my body or look how lightly mm -hmm. I regard this pain that I have to go through in order to achieve this great glory of beauty. Right. And I mean, That's we see that so today, good. even with people, I don't know, doing crazy stuff like waxing. Like, that really hurts, but you look good. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if you've ever watched, uh, there's like this TV show called like Botched, and it's about how people are so willing to risk literally their lives by going to, you know, Tijuana to get, you know, an augmentation done or mm -hmm. liposuction. And it goes horribly wrong, but people are still willing to risk that in order to look good for yeah. that great glory right of the beautiful body yeah which is like super fascinating and then he even talks about how self-mutilating also right sort of the mortification of the flesh can be this uh, sign of goodwill and assurance and he calls christianity out on this Especially in the Middle Ages. Yeah, especially least. wearing, you know, people wearing hair shirts and the flagellation mm -hmm. and the constant, um, yeah, just like <laughs> whipping yourself and like cauterizing wounds and people like stabbing themselves is like a sign of goodwill. Yeah. And so what, what ties all of these together? I, I think it might be this idea that Montaigne touches on with belief, right? That Yeah, mm-hmm. I think that a lot of it has to do with the will, right? Is that mm -hmm. belief is a very powerful factor when it comes to enduring pain. Bold and incalculable, as he says. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And there's that, yeah, there's that little level of kind of um, mind over matter, right? Mm -hmm. If you really have your mind set on something, then the physical pain is, is secondary. Mm. So that sort of closes off the section on pain right but there's but, one oh, wait. however comma there is one last thing because he talks about and he, he deviates a little bit right because he talks about he grief <laughs> <laughs> yeah as, as he can be expected to deviate and he mentions that grief is the most difficult pain mm. and i thought it was interesting because he sort of counters the very active uh, pain of, you know, beautifying yourself or risking physical harm for this greater glory with grief. Because grief is not something we, we actively search for, right? It's something that, that comes to us. And he s says that there's hardly any mischance that cuts one more to the quick than grief. And he talks about a little bit about the the loss of some of his infant children and and how difficult that is. And Montaigne admits that he's too embarrassed to admit at the the misfortunes that he's sort of shown this like disdain towards. And I think that he's saying that usually that's like when it comes to like grieving the family members or lost friends. Yeah, and there's even one would say if you read this essay and you get to that point he's, he's we have this idea that okay one can grieve for their kids but then he shows a certain callousness but he's like yeah it happened yeah. and i i didn't really feel that much emotion when when those infants died and he even gets the number <laughs> he even gets the number wrong of how many kids actually died at least in our translation where there's a little footnote that says, well, actually the number was four instead of three kids. So we have this mm -hmm. sort of blocking out, or I don't even know if it's indifference yeah, like to this out, grief. Maybe? Yeah, where maybe that is part of the grieving process, is that one with their mind sort of shuts out the details of such a injustice or of such pain. Yeah, and it's interesting because he talks about how he sees a lack of children as an equal fortune as having a lot of children. Mm -hmm. And with that, he, you know, essentially ties a bow on this sort of segment on pain. And we see him start to sort of shift gears into poverty mm -hmm. and, and talking about these needs and these wants and yeah. these desires. Because 
having children or at least a procreation that's a value judgment right Mm -hmm. right and so the value according to him is it's the there are a couple things working in it it's our opinion the cost of procurement and what's the value of something to ourselves Mm. getting back to that the taste of good and evil depends Mm -hmm. on us right exactly so poverty then can be a good thing Yeah, I think that poverty, I think, is a good thing because he thinks that slavery to wealth is worse than the pain of poverty. Mm. Go on with that. Because he he kind of sketches out sort of various stages of his life with his like relationship with money, but he makes a really interesting argument that abundance for him creates greed. Not it's not poverty that creates greed. Mm -hmm. because if you think of it i mean think about how you know a lot of how generous you know clergy are you know what i mean or like if you think about like monks or friars and they're you know what i mean like typically those are people who um during that time were you know did a lot of you know work with charity cases Mm -hmm. but they themselves took vows of poverty Right, so we have this again. So there's the most. So the people that have the least were probably the most generous. Mm. And I wonder if that ties to this idea of knowing that there's this balance between the good and evil, like with courage and of beauty, right? Where maybe Mm -hmm. generosity, for it to be something of benefit, one has to know that. At least in one aspect of generosity that you give but expect nothing in return. And that that nothing, poverty, we know poverty to be, I think calling it evil might be extreme, but Mm -hmm. that it is a negative. That one does not seek out to, at least a rational human being does not seek out to not get something in return, but Mm -hmm. to give... Poverty also has to be a good thing because you're giving away and you have nothing. But then there's that fact that, oh, there's nothing. He's getting nothing in return. That's sort of a negative. And that... Yeah, I mean, I could see that. But I think that there's something to be said about the generosity of someone who has less is more impressive than someone who has a lot of material wealth. And why is that? I mean, because isn't it... In Montaigne's view, I guess. Oh, I, I mean... It's and in your view too yeah i mean, yeah, I mean it, where we all are kind of combining montaigne is us and Mon- and we are montaigne yeah but, i mean i think that montaigne essentially says that uh he uses the um i think dionysius the uh the uh syracusan tyrant right he says yeah. that it was really gracious of him once he learned how to stop hoarding mm. like hoarding people's treasure that they just have buried um so I would say in Montaigne's view that it's just considered more gracious to be less selfish. Mm. So I think that's why that if you have less, it's even more impressive to display that much generosity and that much graciousness towards someone when you have less. If that answers your question. That makes perfect sense. Perfect. So... Montaigne is a, almost a financial planner <laughs> yeah. in, this, in this section because he makes a really interesting point that if you go out of your way and if you start to hoard money and chase money and make money, that it gets to a point where you don't control the money, the money starts controlling you. Mm, and I think that goes back to his idea of reason almost controlling us or making us scared, right? We're not mm-hmm. being Piero's right. pig, at least. In- it's that fear, right? Yeah. Yeah, because uh, he relates that there's uh, the first part in his life in his, you know, early 20s or whatever, young adulthood. He, you know, pretty much spent within his means. Like, he didn't really have a lot, but he cultivated a lot of goodwill with his friends. So his friends would constantly extend their loaning periods and he felt really good about this and especially because he didn't he hated haggling Mm -hmm. and i thought it was kind of funny because he was just like haggling doesn't agree with me i hate doing it i always write offers down on pieces of paper which is obviously not good because i'd always get rejected but it was fine so for him 
not being in the best financial shape, he was pretty, pretty happy with that. And he said that it wasn't until he got older and started acquiring more wealth that he became more miserable because he became more concerned with how to hold on to it, how to keep it safe, and he became extremely suspicious of anyone Mm. around his money, who's handling his money. And that especially happened to him while he was traveling on the road through, I think, in Germany and Switzerland and Italy and the like, um, where he said that, you know, sort of more money, more problems, right? Yeah. Yeah. So for him, he just felt almost sort of, um, I guess, burden in a way to, uh, to his wealth. And then it was on that trip where he learned to spend money in a more moderate way. And he gives a couple of uh, stories of his friends, you know, handing over wealth to their servants or one friend or someone he knew traded, you know, spots with a poor friend and the friend in exchange let him live in, you know, his own manner that he had previously owned, you know, kind of like for free with room and board. And he was like, yeah, it's great. I have a place to like, you know, lay my head, but I don't have to worry about the day to day operations of, you know, running this, this huge estate. And he, in effect, says that okay money's great but you need to learn how to not be so attached to it because then you just kind of hoard it and then you do these ridiculous things like preferring to pawn your own clothes or sell your horse in order to avoid dipping into your own purse Mm. so he says that the generosity of spirit with your finances and like with your purse strings are is the the best approach and he ends this with the assertion that ease and poverty really depend on the opinion of each man. And I'll close out this this section with this one quotation. Every man is well or badly off as he thinks himself to be. The man is content who believes himself content, not he with whom the world believes to be so. So really, in in essence, the internal view that you have affects the external. That's that's that's, that's it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, and to, uh, we started with the title. I think we should end with the title because I think that encapsulates what we just talked about, what you mm-hmm. talked about, and what I did is that that the taste of good and evil depends, for a good part, mm-hmm. upon the idea we form of them, and I hope you form an idea of subscribing to our podcast or to Noetic. You can download it on Google Play. You can download it from the App Store. Or you could also take a look at YouTube, at SoundCloud. We're on there as well. And I hope that you find virtue in our content and perhaps can contribute some. And we'd love to have you. So, Jordan, thank you for this discussion of Montaigne. It was really a a feast. (laughs) Thanks, CJ. Thank you for being so generous and joining me tonight. Hey, no problem. Thank you, Montaigne, for giving us the goods and making us think a little deeper and more humanly and I think even just more empathetically to what it is to be human. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and like what it's all about. And uh most of all uh thank you to the generosity of our listeners and i think with that we'll see you guys next week and bye for now be like piro's pig please (laughs)